there's this old neuroscience saying that neurons that fire together wire together. Like a Nobel Prize was awarded for this very simple saying. So neurons firing in synchrony is this really important event that our neurons have adapted to realize. It's like, whoa, me and you, we just fired at exactly the same time. That was special. Let's, let's grow closer to each other. So we strengthen our synaptic connections with each other. Um, and this is the whole underpinning of learning and memory. Hey listeners, it's your host, Jeffrey Wu, and thank you for tuning into this episode of the HVMN podcast. I've always been interested in enhancing cognition. As you guys know, I've spent many years studying nootropics and other techniques to make brains better. One of these interesting emerging techniques is transcranial direct current stimulation, TDCS, which is stimulating the brain with electricity. Enter Halo Neuroscience, a company that's built a TDCS headset called Halo Sport. What's the science behind TDCS and how does it work? I sit down with my friend, Dr. Daniel Chow, Halo's co-founder and CEO, and we discuss the technology powering Halo Sport and the research studies behind it. We dive into the biology of how neurons work and the concept of neurons action potential, and we discuss why and how society buckets us into specialization as we age, but can we still keep that learning rate high even as we age and get older? Halo is an exciting technology that I look forward to continuing my experimentations with. They just launched a new version of their headset, Halo Sport 2 on pre-sale, and we're excited to hook you guys up with an extra $20 off in addition to their $100 pre-sale discount. Visit gethalosport.com slash HVMN or enter code HVMN at checkout. Now enjoy the episode. Dr. Dan Chell, thanks for coming into our office. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we've crossed paths multiple times. I think we've become you know, good friends over the last couple of years. I would call you a good friend. <laughs> over, I mean, I think, yeah, just a number of conferences in the broad human performance space. Uh, we work with a lot of the same customers in elite athletics, the Department of Defense. Uh, but I never really got to hear your full story and background. I know you're a medical doctor. You have a background in neuroscience. You actually were involved with the medical device company around brain and neuroscience. So I'm interested to hear about your medical training and your science training. Yeah. How it led you up to being in the human performance space with Halo Neuroscience. I was a biochemistry major in college. After that experience, I took two years off between undergrad and grad school to work at a lab at UCSF. I was working with this guy. I just lucked into this job. This guy, David Brett, B-R-E, D as in David, T as in Tom. I'd encourage your listeners to look this guy up because um, so at the time, he was the youngest tenured, tenure track professor ever hired by UCSF. He came straight out of an MD PhD from Johns Hopkins, and he looked at, he made, did some groundbreaking work um, in this field of looking at neurotransmitters, specifically nitric oxide, which mm -hmm. I think you've talked about in um, you know, your work yeah. here at HVMN. Uh, so he was the fourth most cited author in the world at the time. He's 29 years old. During my two years with him, we published two papers in Cell, which is the which most is top journal. It's yeah, and it was one of the like one of those papers was one of the most cited papers in all of science that year. A lot of that had to do with the role of nitric oxide in this disease called muscular dystrophy, which is an X-linked disease. Only boys get it, and it's universally fatal. That whole course of science where we just use basic science, couple of science, just like working our ass off in a lab making a discovery that could affect a population of people um, really changed my life. That like, um, like I, I guess many scientists dream of doing this, but here I was 22 years old and we did it. And now there's a drug based on those discoveries that are helping people with muscular dystrophy like double their lifespan. I just thought to myself, like, I wanna rinse and repeat this thing, this thing of doing science to help people populations of people, not one by one, but populations of people in one fell swoop with the discovery as many times as I can. So scaling out medicine beyond just like, like a clinician, just how do we make technology to help people? Yes. So he was an MD PhD and I said, I just want to be Dave. So I'm going to get it. I'm going to like, <laughs> I'm going to pry the medical into these MD PhD programs. So you, like for your listeners who don't know, there's this opportunity where you can get both degrees in about seven or eight years. And 
people who uh, graduate from these programs tend to be scientists. Yeah. They tend to not practice medicine. Like they have an MD, but they tend to not practice clinical medicine. Got into Stanford, super thankful for that, and started on this long journey of getting both degrees. And during that time, two things happened. One was I started to realize that a chemical approach to the brain was wrong. Hmm. So I'm this biochemist and I'm really interested in drug discovery and basically drugging the brain um, with chemicals. And I, I realized that it's just too much to ask for a little molecule that you swallow by mouth to make it to the brain, to go to all the right places at, all, at just the right time for right. it to do its job. Um, and for most drugs related to the brain, um, like y y you see like very matter of fact and common sense problems with this whole approach, right? There's a lot of um, friendly fire across the rest of the body. Like the liver gets blasted, the kidney gets blasted, all these other vital organs right. get blasted unnecessarily. And there's a blood brain barrier, right? So when people talk about nootropics, a lot of the people will say like, hey, these compounds don't actually cross the blood brain barrier. How are you actually totally. getting these compounds where you're supposed to be? 100% yeah. correct. So the, the brain has this privileged circulation. Molecules need to pass the blood-brain barrier to interface with the brain. And that's appropriate because we know the brain is such an important organ, sensitive organ. We should guard its circulation. So the blood-brain barrier does this. So we're asking a little drug to go around the whole body and then get through the blood-brain barrier so that it can interact with the brain. But, you know, the brain is like chemically relatively homogeneous. Like there's um, these receptors and neurotransmitters and they do certain things, but they're kind of all over the place. And this is how we drug the brain. We just hope that it sticks to the right place when like chemically it's more homogeneous than we would want. I still remember like taking these pharmacology classes in medical school that while drugs work amazing for the rest of the body, like drugs is a miracle of modern medicine, really. Um, drugs for the brain um, are like very poor, you know, perhaps as bad as it gets. It's down there with um, cancer drugs. I would say it's just also shown in business, right? All the big pharma companies have kind of shut down their uh, their neurological programs. I yeah. don't think it's just like yeah. well, you seeing it from the uh, student perspective. That's true. These that's big true. drug programs are being shut down. There's less drug discovery in in brain disorders, and it's really the only the very brave that are still doing it. Yeah. But um, you know, some of these drugs are still like blockbuster drugs. I mean, you know, like you know the the whole SSRI category. You know, the Prozac family of drugs. Yeah. Huge, yeah, yeah. The antipsychotic category of drugs, still like multi-billion-dollar drugs for Eli Lilly and other pharma companies yeah, that are enough. making drugs, yeah. and yet they kind of suck. So you know, you're a Stanford grad. Stanford encourages you to take a step back and rethink a completely different approach. And so I did that, and I was thinking, like, what if, what if we built a physical device, like a neurostimulator for the brain? Uh, a physical device has some like really key advantages over a drug. Like a physical device, we can put, we can dribble the electricity exactly where we want, thereby avoiding the rest of the body, the rest of the brain, leaving it alone. Also with a physical device, there's a circuit, right? We connect it to a circuit and we can turn it on and off like a light bulb at our at our disposal. With a drug, there's like no antidote that you can just turn it off, right? Yeah. If you're having a bad day with side effects, you can't turn off the drug. So then I was like, wow, what if we used electricity as medicine? So like, like what started as a concept led to um, my first company. Um, so I wasn't a founder there. I was a single digit employee at this company called Neuropace. So I joined a team where, uh, you know, th th the idea is like, what if we used electricity to treat seizure disorder? So seizure disorder is epilepsy and drugs for epilepsy are notoriously bad. Yeah. Like one third don't work at all. One third, you would rather have epilepsy than the side effects of the drugs. So that's another one third where it doesn't work. And then one third, it works okay. So yeah, we developed this, it's, think of it as like a pacemaker for the brain. It's this medical implant where electrodes go into the brain and there's this onboard computer that's listening to the brain, only delivering electricity when the brain's about to have a seizure. Is this under the skull or is it over the skull? Is it implanted? We take away a piece of skull <laughs> that is the size, the same size and shape as this pacemaker thing. Yeah. And we drop the hardware into that, that hole we just made. Turns out that's not big, that big of a deal. 
Okay. Uh, that I mean, this was, you know, we thought it was a big deal as, but then we talked to neurosurgeons that are like, no, this is child's play. Yeah. Like that, that's, it's putting the electrodes in the brain. That's the hard part. So yeah, we developed this device and it was a big project. It was uh, 10 years of my life. We raised $250 million before one penny of revenue was generated. <laughs> can you believe that? I mean, in Silicon Valley, yes, I can. But I mean, that's, yeah, that's quite but think that's about quite yourself a as an entrepreneur, like yeah. <laughs> raising $250 million before, I mean, that's just selling the promise, like yeah. year over year, raise over raise. I think we were on series H by the time um, by the time I left and we had wow. FDA approval and we were selling products. So it's out there in clinical practice, helping thousands of people with epilepsy in a way that I don't think the world could have imagined before we got there. So yeah, long, arduous, very difficult entrepreneurial experience. Um, like learned a ton, super thankful for the, for the outcome um, in that again, we're able to help a population of people with a piece of technology. Right. Um, so 1% of the world is epilepsy. Like many of us think it's a small disease, but it's actually huh. a highly prevalent disease. That's surprising. I didn't, I mean, that's 1% is, I mean, that's. Yeah, that that's be, material, right? Yeah, it's super material. That's 600, 700 bil a million people. Yeah, I mean, that yeah in the United States, it's like yeah. good 3 million people that have epilepsy. It was also awesome to see other companies doing similar things with neurostimulation. So right now there's um, there's like neurostimulators for chronic pain. They stimulate the spinal cord. There's neurostimulators for Parkinson's disease. They stimulate um, these nuclei in the thalamus and the basal ganglia. Um, there's uh, there's a neurostimulator for incontinence. It controls the nerve that um, that closes the sphincter of the bladder. So these are all like multi hundred million dollar companies at its low end. Right. And um, these are all FDA medical devices, medical gone device. clinical trials and doctors prescribe and install, I don't know, install or implant these devices into, Correct. into patients. And multi tens of thousands of dollars for one unit. Yeah. Um, and all, like you said, medical implants. Um, and Insurance because covers it, these are all completely within sure. the healthcare system. For sure, yeah. there's codes like reimbursement codes and all that stuff yeah. for these products. Um, but many of your listeners may have never heard of this cottage industry that's actually quite big. Yeah, and that's because it's the only the very ill can benefit from this technology. Uh, like, who would assume the surgery and the hardware implanted unless you were like pretty desperate? Like yeah. you tried everything and you have pretty severe, pretty severe disease um, and you've come to like, like what's left? Well, there's this medical implant and so you go for it. There was one side of this whole experience that was really positive. It's like, whoa, a new, new thing for um, you know, this uh, like really needy patient population. But there was this other thing that's like, shit, only a small percentage of these people will actually benefit from it because there's another percentage of it, of these people that are just freaked out by the medical implant. Yeah, sometimes as a technologist, you just you just assume that if you build it good enough, people will just do it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean that only goes to a certain point. Yeah, and I think brain stimulation, like a brain implant, crosses that line for a lot of people. So then I was thinking, like, how can we make this even better? Like, I believe I've seen it with my own eyes that this can work. That electricity could be used as medicine to augment humanity, right? In this case, treating the disease and in other cases, like healthy people enhancing their performance. But like, how can we make this so that it's more accessible? Yeah. And the only way to do that is to make it a wearable. You cannot <laughs> just ex like, oh, it's cool. Let's yeah, just I'm do a pretty some crazy biohacker. It'd be hard <laughs> to convince me to like, okay, oh, let's do some brain surgery, crack open your skull. All right, so if, electrode. Right. If <laughs> Jeff Wu is not ready for it, the world is probably not ready yeah. for it. So <laughs> what are so-called non-invasive techniques to modulate neural activity with neurostimulation with electric fields? And what we found at the time, so this goes back a while, like 10 years ago, there was about 500 papers published on this topic. Mm -hmm. Today, there's about 4,000 papers. So the field's really grown since we first looked at it. Um, and we were really impressed with those early papers, uh, so much so that we started tinkering, um, building our own like very rudimentary devices, like biohacking stuff, yeah. right? Like in like literally our garage and living room, like testing it on ourselves and bringing in our friends, testing it on them, 
replicating other people's work in our own like makeshift lab. Yeah. Uh, and that gave us confidence in the technology. Like when we could replicate other people's work, we're like, this, this thing has some legs. So that gave us the courage to like write up a business plan, raise some money, leave Do you have our, an electrical engineering background to start building a little own TDCS devices? My like, co-founder does, okay. <laughs> not me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, my co-founder is an amazing engineer. He's the CTO of the company. Yeah. And like, yeah, he basically hand built a simple TDCS device. Yeah. And we like, we went to work on ourselves and like we read papers and just replicated other people's protocols and we're able to generate more or less their result. Um, and, and so that led- There's like, no mean feat in science right now where I think some people would say there's a crisis in science where a lot of these studies aren't replicatable, right? A lot of psychology experiments that we all, you know, very well mm. know and hear about like the Stanford Marshall experiment apparently has been debunked. Um, so it is not trivial to say that you can replicate. Thank you for saying that because there's a lot of bull, like we say, oh, published literature, yeah. peer reviewed. A lot of that stuff um, is still garbage. Like <laughs> yeah. a lot of that could be just like a straight up lie. Yeah. Even if it's peer reviewed, I mean, the peer review process like helps, but it, it's like our justice system, it's not absolute. Right. Um, and so, you know, for for me, and you know, I would encourage your listeners like, um, like to really challenge, like even what's peer reviewed, um, in a makeshift study on themselves or with their friends to just like prove it out for themselves. Right. And it was important for us, like, you know, I'm, you know, for me and, you know, for any entrepreneur, like when you choose to found a company, you burn the bridge behind you, right? Like you're raising money, you're risking everything. Yeah. Like, you know, for me, like my scientific credibility, which took a lifetime to build, right. I'm putting on the line to found this company around this core technology that yeah. is called TDCS. So TDCS, for the folks that aren't aware of the acronym, what is it? What are the basic principles? Sure. Let's, you know, what, what are the physics and the physiology behind totally. this, this methodology? Transcranial direct current stimulation, so TDCS. Um, TDCS, uh, as like, a, like for those who don't have um, like electrical engineering backgrounds, it just involves putting a direct current running across your scalp. Um, that's the DC. So um, the frequency is zero. A lot of folks who like kind of know things about brain stimulation, it's like, oh, well, what's the frequency? The, well, the fr there's no frequency. It's just one long, big, long DC pulse. And this DC pulse, in our case, it's 20 minutes, creates this electric field that if it's of a certain strength can penetrate the skull and interact with the cortex. Um, so there's a limit how deep it can penetrate. So it, basically think about it as just being strong enough to get through the skull and interacting with just mere millimeters of depth into the cortex. Because that was going to be one of my follow-up questions, actually. So I'm glad you were, we're, we're diving into some of the questions, right? Like if you were a devil's advocate, okay, the mm. skull is thick. Are yep. you actually, without implanting an electrode into the brain itself, yes. Yes. are you actually getting enough of a field right. to penetrate the skull? So it sounds like... Um, you have data that says that it does. So there's this contrarian view, which you just asked about. It's like, well, you know, what are we talking about? Like in our case, it's like 2.2 milliamps. That's at its max. Yeah. Um, is that enough of an electric field to get through the skull? Which like, you know, that's millimeters thick of bone. Yeah. Um, turns out that it is. Yeah. We can model this, but like, you know, modeling is just modeling. Like uh, what's more important is that you can show some sort of physiology change. So how could we measure this empirically? Um, okay, so let's pick on motor cortex because it's just a nice system because there's an output that is movement. So you can put this TMS coil. TMS coil is transcranial magnetic stimulation and you could use this to fire a magnetic pulse across the skull strong enough that you can tr trigger a uh, muscle contraction. Hmm. Okay, so you can use this as an assay as a, an experimental system, just like, okay, let's fire a magnetic pulse just strong enough to trigger um, a muscle contraction in your thumb. And for whatever reason, they pick on extensor pollicis longus. This so you little, can just raise your thumb. Exactly. So you go like this and <laughs> yeah. you can put a, a little sensor here to, muscle, to measure how strong that mu muscle contraction was. Yeah. So like a diminished, like the smallest amount of magnetic stimulation to trigger um, a muscle contraction. Like this is your system. Yeah. Now, what if we did things to manipulate the system? What if we 
made you stay up all night did the same thing? Like, does it take, like, what happens to this muscle contraction? What if we gave you different drugs, like an antidepressant or um, an ADHD drug or whatever? Sure. Like, you can manipulate the system with different, different uh, like, insults to the system. Now, what if you did TDCS? So it turns out that if you do TDCS, um, the magnetic pulse is going like this and your thumb is going like this, like a small twitch. Right. After TDCS, the same magnetic pulse, this is what happens, a much larger muscle contraction, right? So somehow the TDCS is facilitating the system, right? It's making it – it's like this tissue is more excitable so that a given amount of impulse, keep the impulse the same, is triggering a bigger muscle contraction. Right. So – um, so that that uh, so this foundation this was the f- like the fundamental foundational work by these two German scientists that came up with this in like two thousand three two thousand four right. time frame and from this experiment gave birth to the modern field of TDCS. So basically, you're saying from a mathematical model in terms of the theoretical uh, depth of penetration, and then you're actually running an assay to actually see if you're actually neuro priming. This actually is this intervention actually you know, potentiates an action. And it looks like the data is there that, yes, you can actually manipulate. Yeah, and you can manipulate, and there's a dose response curve and like there's everything about it. And this is like, like one more thing that's interesting is like you could take away, so 20 minutes of TDCS, you take away the TDCS electrode, this effect is still there. So there's some long, there's like, there's this afterglow of effect that you don't need the TMS, sorry, the TDCS electrode to be there for this effect to happen. Yeah. So that was also this magical result that these two German scientists developed. It's like, holy shit. So not only do we get this effect while the TDCS is on, but there's this afterglow that lasts for about an hour. Right. I think getting into the, now to like the neuroscience a little bit, I think, which is interesting to, for our audience. So the electric field potentiates the, the, the neuron potential, this, this firing mechanism of the neurons. How does that exactly work? Um, what is the mechanism there? Uh, obviously, you know, we don't necessarily need to do a master class PhD level right. thesis on it, but at a high level, what is exactly going on there that allows someone to be in this prime state where you can potentiate action? I'll say it the neuroscience way and then we'll like um, we'll back off and 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 talk more conceptually. So for neurons, their whole life, their whole point in being in our body is to fire action potentials. Action potentials propagate signals across our brain through different circuits, and that that does everything for us. It encodes learning and memory. It can, encodes movement. It encodes emotions. It triggers sleep. Everything in the brain is about um, firing action potentials, um, uh, like you know, for our benefit. Now, uh, the fundamental event of an action potential, like how does an action potential get triggered? So it's, um, it's when the neuron's resting membrane potential hits what's called the threshold potential. So the neuron's at rest. If the resting member t- potential like lifts up to this threshold potential, this magic fires, happens. Yeah. Exactly. This exponential thing happens where it fires this action potential. So think of firing an action potential um, like you doing a pull-up. So you're hanging up on a pull-up bar and you're trying to get your chin above this bar. And like once you do, um, this magical thing happens. A lot of biological systems are, are triggered in this way where there's thresholds. And once a threshold it hits, this cascade of events happens. Right. So, and all uh, these signals go into the neuron to, to essentially charge it up enough until it fires. Exactly, right? exactly. So if there's enough neural input so that this resting membrane potential, like are you lifting up to get above this pull-up bar is hit, then this magic happens of triggering an a- action potential. Right, but if you so, don't actually trigger, there's no action potential. So it's kind of like a binary switch. It's like that's, all that's or nothing. Right. If it's sub-threshold, it might as well, nothing would have happened. Yeah. So what TDCS does to a neuron is... Um, like if you saw me th- struggling to do a pull-up and you're like, I know this dude, I'll give him some help. And you give me 20 pounds of assistance. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. Now I, I've got, I've got some help. I can do a pull-up now. Yeah. 
Um, so we're like that 20 pounds of assistance to a neuron. We're just like we're just lifting the resting membrane potential slightly so that it's closer to the threshold potential. So that in and of itself is not that interesting. It gets interesting when you pair that with training. Right. So like you just sitting there, like there's no like right. you've got to do the right. other 80% like, I think of the, the question work, is like, right? yeah, why would that even be good? Now, like it sounds like we're gonna talk about why that, that would be good. Yeah. So like for you, the 20 pounds of assistance, like you can sit there and give me 20 <laughs> pounds of assistance, but there's like another 160 pounds that it's like, listen, I like I know this guy, but I'm not gonna do everything for him. Right. right. It's the same thing um, with TDCS and the brain. Um, so we can do some of the work, but the user needs to do the rest of the work, and that's where the magic happens. So, you know, with with Halo Sport, we're stimulating the motor cortex, um, and the motor cortex is responsible, um, amongst other brain regions, for movement. It's a critical movement center in the brain. So, what we want people to do is stimulate the motor cortex and then go train movement. Right. If you don't train movement, then you just wasted a perfectly good TDCS session. Right, so we want you to train or to use the use Halo Sport for 20, 20 minutes, and then for the next hour, we want you to train movement because like the threshold potential is lower. So every time that you actually train the movement, your action potential fires more easily, and that's going to basically train your movement patterns better. Right, so actually like the kind of a crappy way of saying it, probably. Yeah, so let's let's take it the next step. Yeah. So you're. Um, a population of neurons, say in this case, the motor cortex, is now more excitable. And now you're training, right? So like what, like what happens there that makes you better at movement? So uh, there's this old neuroscience saying that neurons that fire together wire together. Like a Nobel Prize was awarded for this very simple saying. So neurons firing in synchrony is this really important event that our neurons have adapted to realize it's like, whoa, me and you, we just fired at exactly the same time. That was special. Let's, let's grow closer to each other. So we strengthen our synaptic connections with each other. Um, and this is the whole underpinning of learning and memory. Like neurons that fire together, wire together. This wiring together is a literal physical transformation of the way these two neurons are interacting with each other. They grow towards each other. They strengthen those synapses right. with each other physically. So the axons, like, like the little dendrites, actually get closer together. Closer together, eyes. and these these synapses yeah. grow fatter. Huh. And you could stick them under an electron microscope, and you could you could see it. Like this is a computer chip that can morph to your benefit. Yeah. Like you know, you um, etch a piece of silicon from Intel. Like that's a static computer chip. Like imagine if this thing can morph to you, whichever way you want to teach it. Right. right. That's our brain. That's that's like why it's so magical. So we're just trying to hasten this process, right? Like we're just creating this population of neurons, in this case, the motor cortex, combining it with movement so that we can probabilistically, statistically increase the likelihood of two neurons firing in synchrony, right? And then if we do that, then learning happens at an accelerated rate. Yeah. That, that's our whole value proposition. Which is pretty compelling, right? So basically use this uh, electrical potential to hasten learning, which is almost like a free lunch, which is, which is awesome. I think one thing that is interesting for me is that like the 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 audio headset, the, the areas of your electrodes where it hits the motor cortex, is, it seems almost convenient that the, that the like the top area of your brain is exactly where like a headset would sit. I, I mean, if the motor cortex was somewhere else, uh, or if there's some if it's other, <laughs> other regions of brain were there, I mean, how would you think about that? Did it happen to be a happy coincidence because the motor cortex was where a headset would set? If, if like the visual cortex was there, for example, would Halo right. Sport be like Halo seeing things better? Yeah, Curious to hear about you know how you're oh, talking man. exact regions. I love this question because like for once in my life, professionally, I got lucky. <laughs> Are you on a ketogenic diet? interested in intermittent fasting? Well, listen up, we're launching three brand new products to make keto and fasting easier and better. HVMN MCT Oil Powder, Keto Collagen Plus, and Fasting Aid. Our MCT Oil Powder is made of pure C8 fat for fast and sustained keto energy. Our Keto Collagen Plus blends grass-fed collagen protein with MCT C8 to give you the best of the worlds of fat and protein. 
and our fasting aid doubles down on the metabolic benefits of fasting while helping suppress appetite. Currently, these are all on pre-sale at 10% off. The pre-sale discount ends on February 22nd, 2019. Visit www.hvmn.com slash pod to learn more. You can still order after that date, but without that 10% off discount. So act fast. Now, back to the podcast. We love motor cortex. Uh, one, because the data is so strong. Yeah. There's a lot in the published literature. And like we also did a lot of work with our own research to prove it out. Um, and then we just thought, boy, this is a really new technology for the world. People are going to call bullshit on us. If like, it's, a, it's a good claim, anything anything that sounds like good. Too good to be true. Sh- like people people, should challenge it. Right. And yeah. people should challenge it. The motor system is one of these areas where people can prove it to themselves. I mean, you're probably feeling this too with yeah. um, with HVMN, yeah. right? Like take this thing, freaking put yourself on a bike and do an FTP test. Yeah. You can see for yourself that this thing is working, and the motor system is like this beautiful, beautiful thing that like you can you can um, it's it's quantitative. Like you can put numbers against it, and I can show that you can jump higher if you train with Halo Sport. Partly, it was um, it was a byproduct of how easy it is to measure the motor system okay. that led us and the data that led us towards movement training first, and then we're like, whoa, the motor cortex sits like a horseshoe ear to ear. Yeah. Headphones. <laughs> this is awesome, right? Yeah. Let's build it into a set of headphones. The hardware looks like a set of headphones for those that are watching on on video. And these things are the electrodes. So these things is where the electric field is created. What if you wasn't sitting on properly, if it moves? How do you uh, assuage those concerns? Yeah, great um, What if I put it on a different part of my brain? Yep. Is that going to you know, trigger something that I want, don't yeah. want. Are there other, you know, I, I'm not, I don't know the regions of the brain perfectly, yeah, but yeah. what if I put this in the back of my head, the front of my head, am I stimulating other parts that, yeah. can I learn faster or something, like other, trigger other other regions? Let's talk about um, folks that are trying to do the right thing, but just screw up a little yeah. bit. <laughs> okay. Because you described some other things where pe- people are purposely doing something yeah. different. So. Yeah. Uh, if you put this on like a regular set of headphones, there are instru- some instructions for use. Yeah. Like uh, the headset should be vertical. Yeah. If you're standing up straight, the headset should be vertical. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, for for whatever reason, like younger folks, just for style reasons, like like to kick it back a little bit. Yeah. So that's not motor. You're not hitting motor cortex. So tell so, them you're doing it wrong. You're like, doing it wrong. You're triggering. Like what are you what are you hitting? What's behind the motor cortex? Uh, so yeah, you could be hitting language center. Or you could be <laughs> like you could be hitting something other than motor cortex. Okay. So um, as long as you put it on such that it's more or less vertical, like we we're hitting motor cortex. Okay. So we've dev- de- designed these electrodes to be about a centimeter too wide. So if you're a centimeter off, we got you covered. Okay. If you're beyond that, then maybe we don't have all of the motor cortex covered, but we've got probably most of it. Right. Maybe uh, some of your audience is thinking like, well, like it's a centimeter too wide. That means there's some friendly fire. Yeah. Some of its neighbors are being hit. So we know that. So some primary sensory cortex is being hit. Some supplementary motor cortex is getting hit. If anything, we think this might help us a little bit. But because it's the coincidence of where are you stimulated and what you're training, right? Like those are the two things that need to happen for the simulation to work. I now, see. Let's say um, someone didn't go through the app and like, you know, they've got it tilted way too far back. So right. said they're not hitting motor cortex at all. So the worst that could happen is that you're just wasting your time. So you're not getting any any of the lift and learning that you would have had you hit motor cortex. And so if hitting you're, language cortex, you're not training language, you're doing exercise, That all that priming doesn't do anything because you're not even firing in that reach anyways. Right. So like generally when you're working out, you're not talking that much. Yeah. So, you know, you're not exercising your, your language capabilities. Right. So, um, so yeah, you're the, like the worst that could happen is just you're, you're, you're wasting your time. You wasted yeah. a perfectly good neurostimulation session. Right. So what if you went <laughs> off the map, yeah. right? And you're like, hey, I know th- what this thing is doing. Like, yeah. what if I put this over visual cortex right. or I put it over prefrontal cortex or right. whatever? And we know people do this. Okay. And we love these people. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's awesome. You know, it's like, this is a brain stimulator, right. right? And it doesn't, you don't necessarily need it to wear it over motor cortex. You could tilt it forward, tilt it backwards. 
I would just ask those people to make sure they get their neuroanatomy right. Like, you know, headphones are really ideally set up for hitting the top of your head. Right. And if you want to do like visual cortex, it looks, it you know, it's not optimized for that. But, um, you know, if you can hit, um, you can definitely hit visual cortex. And there's data that shows that you can enhance visual acuity in Damn, post. that's interesting. Isn't that interesting? Like, I need that because I'm wearing contacts. I need to get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like um, contacts and everything else yeah. and corrective surgery is about changing um, – like the sensor, right? right? Like, uh, like, or the, the lens. Yeah, yeah. The, the optics. Or, right. Yeah, yeah, the lens. But it turns out that, um, like, you know, it's just like uh, cell phones these days. Like the lens often stays the same, but right. the processor gets better. Right. And that's how we take better photos. It's just, you know, like the computational processing gets better. Yeah. Turns out you can do the same thing with vision. Interesting. So, uh, like, not to digress, but yeah, like. Well, I uh, think it's interesting. I mean, I think that's like poor people. I think obviously, you know, this is designed for mortar cortex and improving sport performance and performance in that aspect. But it's interesting to see, like, if you want to take this off the road, off the paved road, <sighs> where could you go, right? It's like, okay, it's. I mean, it's like end of the day, you have like what it sounds like is like a, a world class TDCS device designed for motor cortex, but if you want to take it off-road, that could be interesting for experimental folks, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the craziest stories you've heard personally, given your, your your customers? I know, obviously, you have great case studies with, you know, the American ski team, other professional athletes. We can talk about the sports indications, but curious to hear about kind of the more wacky use cases. I know that I've seen some of your testimonials with uh, people you know, playing instruments, you know, they feel like they're learning faster when they're playing piano, for example. Mm -hmm. Any, are people trying to use this for, I don't know, I'm just, you know, memory exercises, memory competitions? Mm -hmm. I would say a, like a co number one in terms of volume of data, um, like alongside motor cortex is this part of the brain in your prefrontal cortex called the DLPFC. So dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So uh, for, for your audience, uh, imagine um, the side of your eyes, lateral aspects of your eyes, like take that up to your hairline. That's where it sits. Uh, and this part of the brain is important for cognitive control. Um, so think of focus, attention, vigilance, um, like all of these things are byproducts of cognitive control. Cognitive control is thinking about the things that you want to think about while pushing out all the distractors. Um, people talk about flow states. Flow states, to me, is defined as a long run of cognitive control, right? Where the world could be falling around you and distractors everywhere, but you're in the state where you're like, I'm thinking about this one thing and it's so fluid, right? Uh, uh, a long run of cognitive control begets enhanced memory. Like whatever you're studying will just stick to your brain. Like I don't know if you've had these uh, epic study sessions. Like I think, I think we day. all wish we could always be in flow, right? I think we've all probably in our lives at some point have gone, done some activity, done something where you're like, wow, like time is just flying by. Yeah, and things are just clicking, yeah. right? Like you're on fire for a meeting or there's a study session where just everything goes in. Yeah. So – there are people that use Halo Sport tilted forward and like granted it looks a little goofy. Like how much forward? Like just Yeah, so basically right at your hairline. Okay. Right. Um and they want to turn on so it's always the left DLPFC. Okay. So in that case, they would turn on the right hand. So there's three menu yeah. off. You know yeah. this because yeah, yeah. you're a Halo Sport user. Yeah. There's like the three panels that you can turn on and off. Yeah, that's right. And like, um, like uh, you know, we make it easier for our, our customers. You just pick the body part. Right. Um, but if you pick the body part of the right hand, that means the left electrode is act is the active one. That's the business end. Okay. So I think it's pretty awesome. I gotta try that. I have not tried it that way. So I yeah, I'm a I'm a Halo Sport, I guess version one customer. Uh been using it for I, I mainly the the what what triggered me to try it, this is probably a little bit over a year and a half ago, was at a charity boxing match I needed to train for. I'm like a charity boxing match. <laughs> Long story. A friend uh 
uh, his name is Nagib and I decided to, to watch box we, each other. We 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 were. We were talking about the Mayweather McGregor fight, and we're like, "All right, like that was, I think, during the fall of two thousand, uh, I guess, seventeen. Um, and we're like, "All right, this sounds kind of fun. Let's just like let's do something crazy." And it's like, like he wanted to like train for something. I was like, "Hey, maybe let's let's like fight. Let's let's like put on a little charity thing." And then we just trained hardcore for like three months and just like punch the crap out of each other. <laughs> Which is fine. Are you still friends? <laughs> yeah, we're we're great friends. I mean, I think it's like a bonding experience that like you don't really share with a lot of people. Um, I think in one of the conversations I've had about it, it was just you never get to that kind of intensity in a normal life. Like you just see someone mm. trying to kill you. I'm trying to kill. I was trying to kill him. Like I was legit trying to kill him. <laughs> and you could see it in his eyes. He was legit trying to kill me. <laughs> You're crazy. Um, that you just don't normally get to that kind of intensity in in everyday civil civilization, which is probably a good thing. But it allowed me to kind of see uh, that side of humanity. Um, anyway, so that that what got me into like, all right, I'm gonna get every single advantage I can have. I think one thing that you that stuck with me that I think we had talked about in a previous conversation that you know sport is essentially a game of getting advantage over your opponents. Mm -hmm. That's why you train. That's why you have better nutrition. That's why you have little proprietary secrets or tactics or strategies. Mm -hmm. And I saw this as an interesting way to, to tap into that. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm curious to hear about the upgrade to uh, the version two. Uh, I know that this is on pre-sales now and it'll be released in the spring. Uh, what were the big improvements here? Uh, what have you learned with uh, version one to go into yeah. version two? I think uh, version one users like yourself will really appreciate this. And then for everybody else, they'll just take it for granted. Yeah. Um, so like as an OG, yeah, let me let me, let me me share. So you remember those three electrodes or three primers. Just from an aesthetic perspective, it looks, it looks super clean. It looks like less bulky. So now it's yeah. just, it's one primer strip. So just like less stuff to manage. Yeah. The foam on the nibs, is it just a different foam chemistry that soaks up water a lot better? Like our biggest complaint was that it was hard to get um, good scalp contact. Mm -hmm. um, and we pretty much solved that. We understood that it was just that the foam wasn't getting wet enough. Sounds trivial, but um, it was, yeah, it's like a, it ended up being like a somewhat big problem. We had to fix it. <laughs> and the water is needed for the past current. Correct. Yeah, that's necessary. We can't cheat physics. Yeah. And then we got a lot of feedback that our customers were using the headset as their primary audio headphones. Yeah. And for us, Halo Sport 1, the audio was kind of an afterthought. Right. Like we just threw in some drivers at the and, last and moment. And it was wired, right? And it was wired. Right. Um, so with this one, like we did a proper, you know, audio engineering, like acoustic engineering process, like tuned everything. And now, and now it's wireless and the sound quality like rivals like, you know, Bose and GBL kicks the shit out of beats. This is like what you sit at the desk. You just, when you listen to music, this is so it can rock be. this. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, we understand that, you know, a lot of folks can't afford both over right. the ear headphones and a neurostimulator. So, so now, um, like, you know, of course, we want people to buy this for the neurostimulation first and foremost. <laughs> but, um, but like, uh, you know, it can actually, actually double as your, you know, nice over the ear wireless headphones now. I know you're not designed to wear this while you're doing your actual training. It's like a 20 minute priming session beforehand, then an hour of actual exercise. But I think maybe a lot of people just start doing some sort of warm ups, and obviously some sort of wiredness for for audio is not the ideal setup. That's right. But solving that problem seems like a nice step up in terms of your user experience. Yeah, thanks a lot, Apple. <laughs> way to ditch the cord yeah um but no it's, I, I think it's it's pushing the world in the right direction yeah. if we can just go uh, wireless for everything um oh i should mention that the price came down so the old product was 749 the new product is 399 um it was just making them in higher volumes to say so we can we can negotiate volume discounts and this kind of things so. that's super cool so what are some of the, like going back to the sports side, like what are some of the big wins? I know there's some case studies you had with the ski, American USA ski teams. Um, I know you work with a lot of cyclists. I know, you know, you've done work with the U.S. government, with the military side. What are some of the key anecdotes on that side of the, of the house before, I think we kind of jumped around talking about kind of the, the off-label use cases, but I want to hear about the, um, the, the the design use cases and some of the wins and stories there. They cut across actually a pretty wide swath of like, you know, who we call movement specialists. So like, you know, um, it could be on one side powerlifters where, 
you know, we've got we've got a fair number of powerlifting world records. Like our athletes have set powerlifting world records. Awesome. Um, the complete opposite end of the spectrum is like a violinist, right? Um, and like, so not with the creative or emotional side of producing music, but like the purely mechanical side right. of putting your finger on the right place on the string so that it produces the right sound and like the mechanics of learning that skill. Um, so like, what's the common thread between these two people? Motor is, cortex. Yeah, motor yeah. cortex. Yeah. It's that they practice this movement over and over and over again, begging their brain to commit it to memory. And it takes forever, right? It takes thousands, millions of reps to get it right. Yeah. Um, like, what if we can accelerate that process with neurostimulation? And it turns out that we can. It's been fun talking to people about like what makes an elite athlete, um, like what makes like how can we augment human capabilities yeah. so that we can get more out of our, out of our bodies and i think for for athletes it's a race against time biologically we are going to start breaking down so that you're not in your physical prime yep. at, at some point yeah so it's about getting as much motor learning as you can while you're still in your prime so i would argue that the best athletes are the fastest learners hmm. so like steph curry not a physical specimen, right? Many people are as tall and as big as Steph Curry, and yet he's um, the best basketball player of a generation. And I would argue, and people talk about, oh, he practices a lot, and he does. But a lot of people practice a lot. Maybe even more. <laughs> yeah. And they're not Steph. Yeah. So what is it about Steph, right? Like Steph learns faster. Yeah. With the same number of reps, he gets more, his brain gets more out of it. So, you know, in this arms race, like how can we catch up to stuff? Right. Right. How can we figure out a way so that we can get more out of our reps? Because let's face it, like, you know, training hard and long is kind of celebrated in culture. Right. I think we should question why we train so much, right? Like taking a step back, like why does it take so many three-pointers to get even like a fraction as good as stuff? And that's just because we're begging our brain to like learn this movement pattern, right? And be more consistent in executing this movement pattern, right? Or, um, or anything in life, like right. learning a foreign language. It's like, boy, like please, brain, I'm going to do Duolingo again, <laughs> right? Like please, like I'm begging you to memorize these words right. and these sentence structures, so that I could use it when I go to Italy, right? Right. Um, so, like, I don't know the, the uh, like. I think we all envy really young people and how quickly they can learn right? because their brain is this like hyper plastic and it's so awesome to be young and just to have everything stick. Like watching young people pick up a foreign language, like literally within months, they're like they're semi-fluent. Yeah. yeah. While an adult, it takes, I don't know, years um, before you can get half as good as it. so, I guess it's like, a trade-off, right? Like the plasticity is valuable when you're young to learn new skills, but I guess when you're older, you're more specialized, and the existing pathways are just more static. Yeah. So it's but, that trade-off of youthful blank slate to like, okay, we at this point when you're 30, 40, 50, you've specialized in some pathways that your neurons are used to be firing in, and they're yeah. going to be more efficient. But let me ask you this: how to get this. the best of both worlds is kind of like the question, right? Are we specialized? because we can't learn something new. <laughs> like, are, are we specialized because we have to be specialized? I don't think it's thoughtful. I think it's just our civilization, our environment has trained us right. to be specialized in some sort of arbitrary set of things. Right, so like, you know, I feel, feel like at some point in age, you're differentiated career-wise, right? Yeah. Like, oh, like Dan Chow is a neurostimulation guy. Yeah. And maybe we've become like evolution, like we've become to think this way because, well, Dan can't learn things fast <laughs> enough to do something different. Like I can't like apply for a marketing job in right. you know, some other industry. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to be a professional musician now. Yeah. Right, because like, I just have no faith in this guy that yeah. he can't learn it fast enough. Right. But, you know, I guess like uh, with neurostimulation, I would want to just re-question all yeah, of that. Yeah, can you change right? that paradigm? Can we change that paradigm? Like, can we... Can we be? Can we all be faster learners? And if we could be faster learners, like we're starting with movement, but like let's just have some fun. Like, what if we could all be faster learners so that we can pick up a second language faster, right? And we could have people learning Arabic so that we could have better, more diplomats with the Middle East, 
Like, wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. Right. Or, you know, it could be, uh, it could be anything in life. Like what, like th- think about life dreams that you had as a kid that maybe you gave up on because you're just frustrated with yourself that you can't learn it fast enough. Right. Yeah. I'm also just thinking from like a therapeutic side for like PTSD, which is, you know, something that it come, you know, comes top of mind to me. Like a lot of the theories of why you have PTSD is that some of these memories are so ingrained in your neuron firing pathways that they're just over simulated or over yes. over imprinted. Can you use something like neurostimulation to retrain that some of those pathways so you're not just stressed out totally. with any sort of reminder? Totally. Like f- forgetting is learning. Yeah. Right. That's that's neuroplasticity. Like neuroplasticity, we've been talking about the formation of new neural connections, but it's also the destruction of ones that you don't want anymore. Right. Yeah. Is that the you know, looking out five, 10 year dream of what Halo could become, is that the broader statement? Like, hey, we want to enable people to learn faster. I think both of our companies, we, I see like we're human performance companies, Yeah. right? Um, we're thinking of ways of augmenting human capabilities. So like right now, you know, it's about movement. It's about healthy people augmenting their movement capabilities, movement learning. But, you know, I see this as potentially a drug alternative on the disease side. Like, you know, um, folks that are suffering from some sort of psychiatric, psychiatric or neurologic condition, and they don't really like their drug, but it's the best that they're out there. Right. Like, you know, there should be some sort of counterweight against that. There should be another option. Right. And I think that other option could be using neurostimulation. So, you know, that's the doctor side in me. Like I see at some point Halo being both a consumer and a medical company. Yeah, I mean, I think that's like the the future. I think when a lot of, I'm sure when journalists ask, like, you know, what what do you think healthcare, what do you think, how does biohacking tie in with healthcare and all of that? And I think, I don't think anyone would say that the existing healthcare system is working necessarily. And I think a lot of it totally. will have to be lifestyle driven or in the individual driven. It has to be somewhat personalized to yourself. Totally. I don't think you can expect that an overworked doctor that, you know, is working in this Mm. kind of very cumbersome healthcare insurance system is going to necessarily know and be able to care as much, frankly, about you yourself, caring about yourself. necessarily need to wait for, you know, the powers that be to offer products to us. I agree. Like, you know, there should be like, um, you know, individualization or just taking matters into your own hands. Right. Um, And a thoughtful approach to that is like, you know, one should have a thoughtful approach, like a data driven approach, but like to wait for big pharma companies and the FDA to get around to something. It takes a while, but I think the process is there for a reason. But I think it's also that I think most things are decentralizing. I think the Internet was great for decentralizing information. I think you could make the argument that cryptocurrency are decentralizing Mm -hmm. financial institutions. And I would say like the parallel to me in the human performance or biohacking space is that we're starting to decentralize some of the ivory tower mm-hmm. knowledge in the medical space. Okay, how how can rational, educated people that are looking to read the same PubMed papers, the same published papers, interpret them and apply that possibly to their own use cases, their own totally. indications? One last thing before I forget, I know that you generously provide a special offer for the HVMN podcast listeners. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Halo Sport 2 is on pre-sale right now. Um, for a hundred bucks off the retail price, so it's two ninety nine well, for pre-sale. It'll ship in April. Uh, we'd love to offer your listeners a special code where they can get another twenty bucks off. So two seventy nine. Two seventy nine. Code is HVMN. That's a good deal. That's a steal. I mean, you get like a high quality audio device plus you get some neuro simulation on the That's side. That's right. I mean, I think it was a very fascinating conversation behind the physics and the physiology behind TDCS and and what you're doing with Halo. I mean, I think it was a I, I think it's super helpful conversation to demystify what's something that could sound a little bit too good to be true, but looks like the science and data is there and, you know, encourage. I had a personally positive experience with version one, yeah. so I'm excited to try out version two. So looking forward to continue the conversation and see how much we can do to change the world and change the paradigm here. Totally, man. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Cool. Thanks for tuning in this week. Every month, we release a new HVMN product offer available on our website. Simply visit www.hvmn.com slash pod to view this month's special offer. Of course, writing reviews and sharing the show with your friends are appreciated as well. Until next time, Jeff out.